All right. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you. For those of you on the stream, you, you miss all of the awkward waiting for the countdown to finish. <laughs> well, uh, if there's, sometimes there's conversation going, and I can just stand here and wait and, you know, kind of s- speak when it gets down, but sometimes we're just not talkative, and we stare at each other. So, so good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Nowhere else I'd rather be. If you're just joining us, we are in the tail end of a series on parenting. Uh, It's all on YouTube, uh, I'm pretty sure. There's one series I need to make sure is actually up there. But um, we'll have a playlist uh, with it all together so you can work through from beginning to end. I'll have uh, some notes as well at the end that if you are interested. Because we've covered a lot of ground, and it's a a bit much to try and just remember. Uh, So if this has been helpful and you want resources, I will have those for you. So let's kind of catch back up. We started this whole conversation about principles. And Brian, you can go to the next, I think the next slide. I won't go through them because we've touched on them every week. Uh, But we're taking a principled approach to parenting. And uh, it occurred to me, you know, this is very much like, if if you ever look at those, um, if you ever get those survival guides, like what to do if you're in the desert or what to do if you're here or there. Uh, You know, it's not a map. It doesn't have detailed information about specific geographic areas, but it's general. It's this is how you navigate this kind of terrain, or this is what you do if you get into this situation. Um, And the expectation is, like, a map is for people that are going somewhere where you know where it is. The guide is the principles that are passed down by other explorers for new explorers. You're going somewhere you've never been, you don't have a map, That's kind of what we're doing here. There is no map to parenting because you have a child that is different than every other child that has ever lived. Now, there are similarities, and there are a lot of patterns we can find, but that specific blend of cuteness, mischievousness, all the attributes is unique across time. So there is no map, uh, but we're trying to put together a guide that will give us some principles so that you can find your way as you're charting the map because I believe firmly that this is territory that every parent can navigate successfully. I didn't say it was easy, but I do think it's possible. Um, So we had a number of principles, and then we talked about what is discipline. uh, And we defined it this way for the purposes of this conversation and as parents. One, discipline literally means self-control. And as a parent, my goal is to to instill self-control in my children. So it's not so much about me controlling my children, It is about me giving my children the ability to control themselves. I want to give them the tools to make their own choices purposefully that are in line with their goals, not just be pushed around by passions or circumstances of life, emotions. We talked about this being uh, the goal is to instill right thoughts with the expectation that if we can get them thinking the right way, that will lead to correct behavior. Obviously, we can't actually see thoughts, and we can't directly manipulate thoughts. We, we work with the behavior, but we want, to, we want to get into their head and instill good thinking so that they behave well. And then uh, we touched on, uh, you know, this is a, a goal of, to teach and to grow, not pass judgment. So the goal is not to punish our children because they're children. We're not trying to judge them. We're not, uh, you know keeping account of their sins to then mete out punishments accordingly. The goal is to grow them. So if I can, I I would love to have them avoid the painful consequences of their choices in general, but that's not healthy. But the goal of uh, parenting and discipline within parenting is not to to punish the children. It is to help them grow. Consequences are a part of that, but the goal is to help them grow. Uh, And I wanted to touch, before we go further, because we spent the last several weeks talking about discipline, and we talked specifically about some specific tools of discipline. And um, I know I've probably already stepped on some toes. So I wanted to remind us, like this, uh, if you can go back one slide, uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm leading him on, sorry. I appreciate you trying to follow me. Go to the, the what is discipline. That last one, teaching and growing, not passing judgment. This is a good principle for life in general. Uh, as, and and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more. All these things, I've talked a lot about principles. I haven't, the first couple of weeks we had a lot of scripture. I showed you a lot of stuff in the Bible. The last several weeks I haven't really referenced the Bible a lot. I've just been teaching about principles. And the reason is I just don't have time. 
As it is right now, I'm already pushing the boundaries of what I have time to talk about. But all of these principles, all of these patterns come from the Bible. This is the way that in Scripture we see God dealing with us. This is the way we see healthy parents dealing with their children. We can see unhealthy examples of a lot of this in Scripture as well. So I will, um, I'll touch on that, but this is one of them. This, we're not trying to judge, we're teaching to grow and not pass judgment. This is the way that God deals with us. Um, when we, there, there is coming a day of judgment, and we will all be accountable for our lives, but now we're in an age of grace, and God is working with us to help grow us, not to just punish us and judge us. Um, so, point is, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we're trying to bring up children that are uh, able to order their own life, that have all the skills they need to be successful without us. Hopefully they want us in their life, but they shouldn't need us. He needs to spend it. That's what brings her to I'm going to his butt and I'm going to his We'll let, uh, Jonathan has his own very strong opinions on <laughs> parental discipline. So we'll let David talk to him. But um, we have to be gracious with ourselves, Just as we're being gracious with our children and we're being mindful that we're trying to grow them, we have to be similarly gracious with ourselves. So if I've stepped on your toes the last couple weeks, uh, know that I'm not, there's nothing I've said that has pointed at anyone. Um, and I know sometimes, because I felt this myself, you realize something and you look back and you're like, man, I screwed it up. Like my kids are five and I, I messed up there. Like I should have spent more time with them as a baby, or my kids are 10, and I should have taught them this when they were five, or my kids are 15, or... And it's easy to look back and beat ourselves up. But let me, let me put it nicely, and then let me put it bluntly. Uh, to put it nicely, you can't change the past, right? It is what it is. It is done. The past is finished. It is immutable. We're doing the best we can at every step of the way. So what we have to do now is take the opportunity to reflect and do the best we can moving forward. Don't beat yourself up over the past. Don't beat yourself up if there's things you wish you could do better. That's a good wish. Let's do better going forward. And to put it bluntly, this isn't about me. It's not about you. Like sometimes we get, we get feeling bad about ourselves as parents. Well, I'm not a good parent. Well, my feeling bad doesn't necessarily help my kid. Like, don't worry. It's not about you. It's, not, it's about what's best for your children. It's about how do you grow your relationship with them. So... Take the emotional lumps, learn what you can, but don't dwell on stuff. Just take it to God. And uh, if I have anything to say to you, I think from the Lord in that it is, today is the day. Today is the day to make a change. Today is the day to plant the tree. Today is the day to move forward. So don't beat yourself up about the past. And the final thing I wanted to kind of remind us uh, going forward, as we talked about all these tools of discipline, and we'll, we'll go jump back into them, our goal, ultimately, uh, it's, it's easy. We're talking about discipline. It's the big part of this series, so it's easy to feel like this is what we're doing all the time. But the goal, ultimately, is to discipline less. Ideally, discipline is a small portion of my parenting. It's not a majority. Now, that's maybe on the average of their entire life. There are definitely seasons where it feels like there's an abundance of discipline right now. But it is something to kind of step back. And as you're navigating this, this journey with your children and you're trying to evaluate, that's one of the things you can ask yourself. Has it been all negative? Does it feel like we're in this season where it's just all they're hearing from me is no, 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 correction, correction. Well, how can I balance that? How can I change that and, and balance in some positives, some, some good stuff? And again, I'm not going to give you a, a map, you have to make your own decision. Maybe it's like, well, right now we're just dealing with some stuff and we're in a phase and we've got to deal with it until the lesson's learned or they get out of the phase. And uh, that's another, I'll throw that in there kind of free. That sometimes they go through phases and it's like, didn't you learn this already? Well, they did, but now they've incorporated new data about the world and they're relearning things they've already learned and they go through it again. And uh, it feels like, it feels like it's just, oh, we already did this, but, but you didn't actually, they're learning it at a deeper level. They're learning a new truth about it. They're incorporating more. So our goal ultimately is to discipline less. Okay, last time we talked about three uh, tools, which were natural consequences. Um, I didn't put them on my slides. I should have. We talked about natural consequences. We talked about uh, 
corporal punishment, spanking, and we talked about the other one, I can't remember what I called it. Basically, uh, oh, negotiated agreement, trying to get to a yes, uh, recognizing that a lot of times kids are doing what they're doing not because they're trying to be rebellious or bad, they just want to do something, and a lot of times as parents, rather than butting heads, we can choose to direct that into a healthy way, and that's usually much healthier. So today we're going to talk about these three, timeout and isolation, restriction of freedoms, and conversation and lecture. And uh, so let, let's jump straight in. Timeout. The operating principle for timeout is this. It is the statement, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Ryan. It is the statement that, oh, hold on. The verse is correct, the title is wrong. Who put these slides together? <laughs> oh. I know him, I'm going to have a conversation with him later. I mentioned that all of this was based in principle from Scripture, right? None of this is just stuff I've come up with. You see an echo of a lot of this stuff in, like, child psychology literature because truth is truth. All truth is God's truth. And if we're genuinely seeking truth, I believe we're going to land on the principles God ordered the world with. But we do see it in Scripture. In Jeremiah, we're going through the Minor Prophets on Wednesdays. If you're not attending those, uh, it's been very good. We talked about uh, Jonah and Joel. They've been excellent. Jeremiah is another one of those doom and gloom prophets. Literally, he's, he's the guy who wrote Lamentations, right? Same, Jeremiah. In the middle of this whole conversation about what God is going to do to judge Israel and how they're going to be kicked out of the land and all that, you have this statement. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Notice, this is parental language. This is God the Father leading his people. And you'll notice a lot of the tools we talked about. Negotiated agreement, agreeing ahead of time, clear boundaries. Let's see here. Not that covenant, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. There's this contrast between the law of Moses that was written on the tablets of stone, which was the law that was previously delivered that they broke, that covenant, and this law that he says, In the future, I'm going to put it on their hearts. And there's other scripture, I don't, I mean, that's not going to be a lesson for today, but I'm tempted to jump in and talk about it. This is the transition from the Old Testament, where you have an external law that's imposed on the people, that Paul told us ultimately can't save, it can only condemn, versus the New Testament, where you have an internal law that flows from the outside in, that does lead to salvation, that gives us the power to overcome sin, and is, surpasses the law. It's not, the law's not bad, the law's good, but without the Spirit coming from within, we're unable to actually fulfill the law. This is what we're trying to do with parenting. I don't want to just impose order and structure and force my children to do what's right. I want my children to understand what's right, and I want that to flow outward. I want these laws to be in their hearts, not on a list that I put on my refrigerator with consequences attached. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad tool, but the goal is get it in. Okay, with that context, let's go to timeouts. How do timeouts work? How do we use them? Here's the operating principle of timeouts. It's this statement, your behavior is either unacceptable or inappropriate for the circumstances. I'm going to remove you from the situation until such a time as you can behave acceptably and appropriately for the situation. So we talked about uh, spanking as an effective tool for young children. Timeout is also a very effective tool for young children. When the consequences are too abstract for them to really understand, timeout is a good artificial consequence that you can impose. But I would argue it's, it's not quite as sharp as uh, spanking is, but I think it's more broadly applicable. It's more generally useful. Um, I'm not going to go back into spanking. I talked a lot about that last week, if you want my thoughts there. Uh, go see that one. 
this was also one that will scale because this, the principle behind effective timeout really is the principle behind self-discipline because we can tie this easily to all sorts of behaviors. Timeout is fundamentally about the abstinence and withdrawal from a specific behavior or situation. I'm going to stop doing that because they're not prepared or equipped to handle it right now. That's the fundamental part of self-discipline, right? So if you can teach them to put themselves in timeout when they need to, you've actually taught them a really effective means of self-discipline. Go to the next slide, Ryan. This is kind of, in my opinion, the high-level view of what happens in a timeout, an effective timeout. One, you recognize that they're in a situation and it's escalating, and things are not peaceful, it's, it's bad and it's getting worse. They're losing self-control because they're being uh, overstimulated. There's something that is stimulating an unhealthy response. They're getting angry, they're getting sad. It doesn't necessarily have to be anger. There's some situation that's spiraling out of control. They don't have the skills to handle it. So I, as the parent, disengage and remove them from the situation. The first thing I do is I stop the bleeding, so to speak. I take them out of the situation that's causing them to react inappropriately. And then once I've disengaged them from the situation, I put them somewhere where they have space to think and calm down, where they're not under threat, they're not getting angry, they're removed from the thing that was poking them. Now they're in a place where they can calm down. Once they're in that place where they can calm down, I want them to evaluate what happened. Think about it. Why, did, why were you screaming at your sisters? Why were you hitting that kid on the playground? Why, like this, you blew up, something happened that was out of control or un inappropriate. Why did that happen? Well, I got angry because of this. Okay, why were you angry? Well, they did this. Okay, well, what led, like, figure out what happened. And what could you have done instead? So a lot of times our anger is justified. A lot of times our emotions are justified, right? The, God gave us our emotions. They're not bad, but we have to be in control of them, not them in control of us. Our emotions are an input. We have to pay attention to them, but then we have to choose how to respond. And that's a big part of that is helping them to see, okay, you know, they said this, it wasn't nice, and you felt, you know, so you responded and you went on the attack and you yelled and then they yelled back and then it blew up, right? Well, what could we have done? Well, when they said that, that wasn't nice, it didn't feel good, but you don't have to fight back. You didn't have to go on the attack back. You could have either tried to you know, talk to them about it or if it wouldn't be effective, you could come get an adult. Or right? This is where you talk through what should you have done. Take a walk. <laughs> Once you have done that evaluation, well, I'm going to come back to that. <clears throat> Once you've done that evaluation, you've thought through what happened, why did it happen, what could I have done better. <coughs> this is mental practice, right? This is them working mentally through the problem of what they should have done. Then you re-engage and you try the new approach, right? Now, if you stop and think about it, this cycle is the basic principle, basic formula for getting better at anything. Right? You fail, step one. You take a step back. You evaluate, why did I fail? What happened? You practice how to get better. You try again. This is a general pattern for getting better at anything, just applied to interpersonal relationships. And that's why timeout can scale effectively, even as Brother Goss mentioned, even to, into our adulthood. And the thing is, all of these steps are necessary. Because if you don't, if you don't have the ability to recognize that you're in an escalating situation, then your anger, your emotions are going to get you into so much trouble before your brain has even had a chance to catch up, right? We even have expressions, right? His mouth was writing checks that his, uh, you know, body couldn't cash or, you know, we, we, we know this happens. We get runaway train and, and by the time we come to our senses, we've made a huge mess. You have to learn how to recognize when you're in an escalating situation. And the thing is, let me take a step back. Like, as a parent, I have to do this for them first, right? I have to go through this process. I recognize they're in a situation they can't control. I put them in timeout. I help them calm down. I teach them how to calm down. I help them to think through what it is. But my goal is to teach them how to do this so that they recognize it. So you have to be able to recognize you're in an escalating situation. You have to be able to disengage and remove yourself from the situation. If you don't know how to get out of a fight, 
you're going to be, you know, that's the next step. It might, it doesn't, it does no good to say, man, I'm saying a lot of stupid stuff. I'm about to say some stupid stuff. I'm about to blow up. But if I have no way to disengage and like control myself and not, it doesn't help me the fact that I've learned it. I have to be able to find a safe place to calm down. I have to learn that ability. This is one of those things that I, I've read a lot of literature about it, but I've never seen any effective way to teach someone how to calm down other than practice. You have to practice. Because it's, it's an emotional, it's a feeling. I can't even explain how it feels. I know what it feels like very intimately. Like that, that rising sense of, of either anger or just high emotion. And like what it feels like to consciously calm myself down. So this is one where there's a lot of, anybody know the blow out the candles? Okay, here's my fingers. Blow out. Right. Breath work. Okay, take deep breath with me. There's a lot of techniques. I'm not going to go into them all right now, but you have to teach this. It doesn't come naturally. We don't naturally calm ourselves down. We naturally get more emotional. All right, we, if you can't evaluate what happened and how to change it, then you have no hope of improving. And if you don't reapply this, you're in trouble too. Um, Elijah, when he was younger, he had this bad habit of he'd get, he, he'd get to step three. He'd recognize he was in a situation that was escalating. He would disengage. He would find his hiding place, and then he would just never come out. <laughs> and, and if it got emotional again, it's like, boop, bye. And it's like, Elijah, you, you have to, like, okay. Like, now it's no longer... You know, this isn't a healthy timeout pattern. This is, this is you running from the problem. If you don't do step four and five, you never overcome the problem. You just run from it. And then that, be closed, that creates barriers in your life where there's things you can't do because you hit this problem and you run away, right? So all these steps are necessary. And as I said, at, at the start, you as the parent have to teach them this. You have to do this for them, especially when they're really young. Um, you have to be the scaffolding. But over time, you want them to learn to do this themselves. So how do we actually do this effectively? Go to the next slide for me, Ryan. Let me give you some recommendations. One is set expectations clearly beforehand. This is true in all of them, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's so crucial. They should understand like, what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Right? If they're acting in a situation that, and it's unacceptable and you have to pull them out, they need to understand why, and ideally before something happens. Uh, as the parent who's trying to go through this process, you need to identify the behavior that's being controlled and the conditions of release. Uh, because again, as I mentioned last week, all coercive methods of discipline can be abusive. Time out, because, uh, so, again, if you want to hear my thoughts on spanking, go to last week. But spanking is a very, um, I'll say this much, it's a very sharp blade. It has the potential to do a lot of harm. But it is a tool. It has to be used effectively. Oftentimes we think, well, it's just bad. Let's just put it in the tool. And I don't think you have to spank your children to discipline effectively. If you choose, that's something I'm not going to do. Okay. But don't think that just because timeout is not a physical sharp tool, that it's not dangerous. Because applied inappropriately, this can be abusive too. So identify why are they in timeout. What's the purpose? I'm not just putting them there because I can't deal with it right now, because I'm stressed out and because they're stressing me out. I mean, that might be a reason we have to find some way to create boundaries, but that can't be the motivating reason that I put them in timeout because I can't handle it, right? If that's the case, I need to have a, pad, a, like a plan to get to where I can handle it because that's not a healthy way for me just... So if I'm putting them in timeout, there's a reason, and I should identify what gets them in timeout and what gets them out of timeout. Um, I didn't put this on there, but... Has anyone heard the recommendation, uh, put them in timeout for one minute per year of age of the child? Yeah. So I actually don't, uh, I, I like and I don't like that advice. What I like about that advice is you have to consider the age of the child, right? The timeout has to be appropriate for the age. If you're working with a three-year-old, which timeout works for three-year-olds, timeout works for two-year-olds, timeout works as long as they're able to think about what they're doing at A level, which is earlier than we usually think. So. But timeout for a two-year-old is going to look very different than timeout for a 10-year-old, right? Um, timeout for the two-year-old, a lot of times, the whole purpose of timeout is just to get them to calm down. Like, they're not even consciously aware of what's going on. I'm just removing them from the stimulus so they can get distracted and start playing with something else and get happy and problem solved, right? For a 10-year-old, 
that is totally the wrong thing, right? For a 10-year-old, if I'm putting them in timeout, it's because I'm trying to address a specific behavior that they can understand and deal with. So consider the age. I like that about it. But I don't like setting specific times for timeout because I think it makes it too easy for us to just have unthought through consequences. My pre preference is it's too easy for them to interpret you're being punished because here's the timer. Well, you did this, so that's five minutes in timeout. Well, you did this, so that's 10 minutes in timeout. Well, you did this, so that's, that's 15 minutes in timeout, right? That feels very much crime and punishment, which is not our goal. My preference for timeout, the message I want to send is your behavior was unacceptable and it has disqualified you from participation until such a time as your behavior has changed. So again, going back to our principle of child-led discipline, not meaning that the child's in control, but my discipline is tailored to what they're doing. It's about their behavior. So my timeout is based on what are they doing. If they can't get themselves back in control, you know, we might not go back to the park for a week until I, like, it's not about, like, well, we're not going to the park for two weeks. It's like, two weeks later, I don't think you actually are going to behave, so we're just not going until you fix the things that, and I'll help you fix it. But, or maybe it's, you know, I took you to the car because we're at the park and you're throwing a fit and you're not behaving appropriately, so I'm removing you from the situation. But by the time we get to the car, you've calmed down, you've, processed, you've gone through those steps, you've processed it, you've figured out what you did wrong, you've figured out what you want to do instead. Can I go back and play? If I think genuinely you've, like you've calmed down, you've thought about your behavior, you've chosen something else and you're ready to re-engage, okay, yeah, let's go back. Like maybe it's only been five minutes, walk to the car. But if they're ready, okay, right? So I don't like specific times. I do think we have to be mindful of the age of the child, but it should be tied to their behavior. I, I've used that example of when Elijah was very young I, I, and he would get so emotional, he'd hit himself and hurt himself and my solution was to physically restrain him until I could calm him down. But he was in control the whole time, right? As soon as he would calm down and relax, I'd let him go. So I'm not, you know, capturing him, I'm protecting him. Similar thing here, they're in control. You're in timeout because your behavior has placed you there. As soon as your behavior is better, okay, you're good. That reinforces their self-discipline. Uh, their, their self They're learning how to control themselves. Um, that is a, a decent rule of thumb, right? Like if I have a two-year-old and they're still in timeout 10 minutes later, like maybe I just need to put them in a different situation entirely because they're not at a place where they can handle. Well, the job that occurs yes. to me while you're going through this too, um, you know, you, we, we talk a lot, we taught even here on boundaries and boundaries and relationships. And timeouts have, the, the principle of timeout has a lot of similarities to principles of establishing proper boundaries especially in relationships that can be abusive or harmful, um, the, the principles involved are, are, are pretty similar. Which is why this is such an effective discipline from a very young age, even into adulthood, because the fundamental principle is about self-control and about setting clear expectations and healthy boundaries. So some other uh, things. So as I mentioned, pay attention to their behavior rather than setting tech time, keep their age in mind. It even prompt them as time passes, right? So if they're in timeout and they're still worked up, you know, are, are you ready to? Do you want to go play? Like, rather, you're almost turning it on its head, right? Sometimes it's like, well, you're in timeout for 10 minutes and the kid's like four minutes in, can I get out now? Can I get out now? And, you know, if you've said 10 minutes, then you have to do 10 minutes because, well, we said we have to be consistent. We have to be honest with our children. If we, if we say it, we should mean it. If we don't mean it, we shouldn't say it. We shouldn't do it. But if you flip it around, they're in timeout until they can nice. Then you can push them. Hey, I want you to get out of timeout. I don't want you to be in timeout, but you're not behaving properly. Are you ready to come out of timeout? Do you see how that turns the dynamic around? And instead of the parent being the authoritarian who's ruling the child, the parent is the one who's creating safe boundaries and helping, trying to push the child to, to behave well. But it puts you in a different situation. You're not fighting your child. You're not ruling over them. Um, you can put things in timeout. It doesn't have to just be people. So, for example, if uh, your kid is playing with the markers and they're coloring on the walls and you tell them no, and now they know clearly you don't color on the walls and they continue to color on the walls, maybe the markers go in timeout. But I will say this, just be careful to be intentional because I know at least for me, out of sight, out of mind, if I take the markers and I put them in a shelf somewhere where I can't see them, those markers are never coming back. <laughs> right? 
but maybe I put them on the kitchen counter where everyone can see them. Number one, it creates a reminder for the child to think about their behavior. And number two, it creates a reminder for me <laughs> to think about their behavior. And now, every time at breakfast, they see it. Well, hey, can I have my markers? Well, are you going to draw on the walls? No? Okay, yeah. So you can put things in timeout. You can put yourself in timeout, as Brother Goss was mentioning. This is actually a good thing to show your children. I wouldn't do it artificially, but if the circumstance arises where you're getting upset, I, you know, we've talked about not training your children to, like, not letting your children train you to be mean, that uh, the idea is oftentimes we don't actually act until we've gotten angry ourselves. So if we'll act earlier before we get angry, we can avoid getting angry. But let's say we, we mess up, and like I'm mad at my kids, and I, I, they've disobeyed me, they're not doing the right thing, and like I'm ready to just, you know, mm. and then I say, you know what, okay, you go to your room, I'm going to go to my room, I'm going to come get you in five or ten minutes, I'm too upset, like, and it's okay to say this, I'll, well, let me just say it and I'll preface it, it's okay to tell your children, look, I've gotten so frustrated dealing with you, that I'm not in a good frame of mind, to talk to you about this. Now, you have to be careful. You don't want to make your children responsible for your emotions. That's not healthy. You are responsible for your emotions. You're the adult. They're the child. But it is a good thing to show them I still have emotions. I'm not a robot that is perfect adult and never gets mad. Like, this interaction frustrated me. It's not your fault. You're involved. <laughs> but I'm the adult. And the way I'm going to handle it is I'm going to put myself in timeout. You're going in timeout, too, because you need it, too. Probably. I mean, maybe not. Maybe. But I'm going to put myself until I can calm down. Because timeout's not a punishment. Timeout is a tool for me to regain self-control. I'm applying it to you, and you don't have a choice. I'm doing it to you. But you're seeing that it applies to me, too. I use it in my own life. This isn't just something I'm enforcing on you. This is a tool that I use. Right? So you can put yourself in timeout. This shows them you're not above the law. It proves to them a couple things that you actually want what's best for them, because when you're in the same situation they're in, you do the same thing. So what you're showing them is, I'm giving you my best tools. I'm giving you the tools I use. It's not just that I'm trying to control you, but I'm trying to help you uh, to be successful. It shows them that you genuinely, genuinely believe what you're teaching them. It shows them that they're normal. They're immature, but they're not like abnormal or wrong. The same thing still happens for adults. And it shows them that these tools do work. And it's not just you pushing on them. OK, so I'm, of course, running out of time, as always. Let me finish up the conversation on timeout, and then we'll go to um, restrictions. Other thing, so emphasize the good behavior that allows them out. Right? You have to talk about the bad behavior that put them there. They're out of control. But emphasize what they should do, the good behavior that grants them freedom. Right. Um, that allows them to re-engage. Brother Johnson, can I just emphasize mm -hmm. that? Because um, not doing something is a very hard standard to match. Like, well, how long do I have to not do it until I match that behavior? But giving, giving someone positive um, things that they can do instead and then demonstrate that I'm actively doing that in lieu of doing this other thing is a much, a much more uh, effective way of Whatever behavior it is that you're trying to change, like if you say I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna eat cake, right? Well, you're gonna think about cake. You're gonna want to eat cake all the time because you're not, you're trying not to do this behavior. Mm -hmm. But when you say, here's what I'm gonna do instead, then when I get hungry for cake, I'm gonna go do this or I'm gonna do that instead. Then the alternative behavior becomes the solution as opposed to the focus on the negative behavior. And you can focus on the positive, right? That can occupy the mind. Um, the last thing I'll say here is that timeout, one timeout can lead to another, but focus on one thing at a time. So for example, let's use that markers example. They're throwing a temper tantrum because the markers are in timeout, right? So it started about the markers, but now they're, they're throwing a temper tantrum. They're acting uh, in an unacceptable way. Maybe they're screaming, and this is, you know, I use that example of the anger where they ignore you until you yell at them. This is the same thing, but the opposite way. If, you don't have to put up with your kids screaming. Like, no one wants someone to be screaming at them. And the solution, if your child is screaming at you and just 
yelling and blowing your ears away is not to sit there and try and reason with them. It's like, no, you go and time out in your room and I'm going to close the door and I'm going to put a pillow underneath it until you stop screaming at me. Now, you can say, well, what if they just go play in the room? Well, I'm, the, the room's not a punishment. I mean, actually, I'm happy. If they go in their room and they get distracted by toys and they start playing and they stop screaming, great. I'm not going to go interrupt their playing and talk to them about their screaming. But the goal was for them to calm down. The goal was to stop the screaming. So if your child is screaming at you, put them in timeout. Don't sit there and let yourself get so... There, there's nothing more effective at escalating emotions in a parent than their child screaming in their face, at least in my experience. So don't put yourself through it. Put them in timeout. So one timeout can lead to another. Okay, now you're screaming at me. Now you're throwing a temper tantrum. We're, we're still going to talk about the markers, but right now we're going to put that aside and you're in timeout for the screaming. We're going to deal with this right now. And then once we've done with that, we'll come back and deal with this right now. <coughs> but one thing at a time, because you're trying to teach effectively, and you have too many things, it's hard to keep track, especially as they're young. Uh, I've even done this with our, with our children. Um, this, this happened to me growing up, and it's now been replicated to my children. I'll use myself as an example, because I've used my children a lot. My brother, uh, y'all, those of you who know my younger brother, he was such a stinker. Uh, I love my brother. He's a fantastic guy. But y'all can probably imagine how he... I was the older brother. I was more reserved. He would needle me and poke me and aggravate me and do things that made me, got me upset. And he would just aggravate me. I'd get angry and angry until the point where I whacked him. And then I would get in trouble. I'd get spanked or I'd be put in time out or have a lecture from dad, depending on how old I was. And, and one of my first responses was, well, he did this. And my dad's response was, well, yes, and I'm going to talk to him about that. And in fact, I would have just talked, but then you hit him. And now we have to talk about that instead. Like, his behavior was a problem, but you made it worse, and now I have to deal with you. So, this still happens. It's happened with my children, too. It'll probably happen with yours. All right, um, we are close to time, and I don't want to... I've got a lot I want to... I don't want to try and just jump through. Let's talk about restriction of freedom, and then we'll, uh, we'll see if we can wrap it up there. The operating principle behind the restriction of freedom is an extension of timeout, basically. But it puts more control in the child's hands. The operating behind, principle behind freedom is you've proven yourself unable to responsibly handle something. So I am going to restrict you to a lesser degree of freedom with regard to that thing until such a time as you've shown that you can handle it responsibly. Now, a couple things I want to note. The way this is set up, freedom is the default. Like, I am assume you're going to behave well, and I'm going to allow you to do almost anything you want within limits of acceptability. And it's when you show you're unable to handle some things that then I start clamping down on you. Which oftentimes our default is the opposite. You can't do anything until I slowly, and there is a place for that, right? Like, I'm not going to let my five-year-old jump behind the wheel of a car and drive, right? But within the realm of things that I found a 10-year-old should be able to handle playing with their friends, right? So I'm going to allow them to play in their friends at the park. I'll be there, whatever. But I'm not going to create all these boundaries until they show me they can't handle it. So I want to default to freedom and then respond to what they do. This is effective as soon as they're old enough to truly understand the consequences of their actions. So like a 2-year-old, this isn't going to work. They, don't, they have, don't, don't have enough of a conception. But you'd be surprised how early this does work. Uh, this is particularly important for teenagers because this is training for adulthood. As an adult, they have total freedom within the bounds of the law. But even the law doesn't do anything until you violate it and then you get clamped down. Right? This is training for adulthood. This contains the core truth. You have freedom of choice, the ability to direct your life. And oftentimes, kids don't hear that from their parents. They don't hear from their parents, you have the power to choose. They know it instinctively, and they'll butt heads with their parents if they feel it's not respected. But they rarely hear from us. You have freedom to choose. This is the chance for them to show what they've learned, right? If we, um, if we will allow them this and we will work with them, this is empowering on multiple levels. It gives, them, it gives you the opportunity to praise them for good decision making. So you've built in a positive interaction with your kid based on something they've done. I can be proud of them for what they've done. It gives them the... Them the self, it gives them the chance to prove to themselves that they can make good decisions. 
that they don't just have to do what mom and dad said, but they can make good decisions. They're going to push our boundaries anyways. So with this approach, we're showing them that we want them to grow. I want you to have freedom. I want you to be able to do things. I just want you to do it in a mature way. I want you to handle it responsibly. And you get to work with them to determine and establish their own opinions, desires, and identity. This is why this is so important in the teenage years. The teenage years, I'm convinced, are about them choosing who am I going to be? What do I care about? What's my perspective? What kind of person am I going to be? And so this allows you to work with them as they do that. Because they're, they're going to establish an identity independent of you. I won't, uh, that's for later. I'm not going to jump into that too much. So how do we use this effectively? One, we clear expectations, clear limits, clear principles. They need to know where the lines are, right? They need to know why the lines are there. Even if they disagree with your lines, they should know where the lines are and why you have those lines. Because the goal is I want them to be drawing lines in situations they haven't been in yet. When I haven't given them explicit rules because I haven't thought about that scenario, I want them to understand the principle so they can draw healthy lines. Because this is, and I'm, I'm jumping uh, a good bit because I don't want to take too much more of your time. Because this, this is like timeout. This is another thing that is a fundamental tool that adults should use, right? And that's a good thing to do. When you're trying to help them understand why you've restricted their freedom, use yourself as an example, right? Surely, think about it on your own. As part of your own maturity as an adult, as a Christian, there are things you've identified that you could do, but you don't, right? In finances, maybe? Are there self-disciplines you have in finances, lines you've drawn around your finances? What about extramarital relationships? Your coworkers, your friends, are there lines you've drawn there? What about your work, play, life balance? Are there lines you've drawn to protect your family, to protect your work, to make sure you can work effectively? This is something we all do as an adult, is we identify what kind of person do I want to be? So what are the boundaries of acceptable behavior to be the kind of person I want to be? What are the things that are going to accomplish my goals? That means there's some things that are off limits. Not because I can't do them, I can do them. This is a scriptural principle as well. All things are permissible as a Christian, but not all things are healthy. Not all things are good for me. So there are lines I draw that I don't cross, not because I can't, not because someone's forcing me not to, but because I have a goal in mind, right. and I want to achieve that goal. And if I cross that line, I'm going to hinder myself. So you can use that as an example. Look, this applies to me too. This is in my life too. And when you get to be an adult, you get to draw all your own lines. But for right now, you've got to work with mine. So as much as possible, use real consequences. Uh, the preference here is not to create consequences, but to bring consequences in, right? So, uh, you know, if you're taking away a cell phone or something, can work, but only if it's clearly tied to the behavior you're trying to correct. And similar to timeout, um, they get to decide when they get freedom back. How do they, and not when they say it, when they show it. When they can show responsibility, they regain the freedom. Um, similar to timeout, the duration is tied to behavior, not arbitrary or fixed time scales. Uh, because again, we're trying to, even more than time out, show them you're the one in control. And uh, I'll have a lot more to talk about this topic on the last one, which is about letting go. What do we do when we get to the end of this journey? But this is the start of the transition from adult parent to child to adult parent and adult child, right? Ultimately, when they get to adulthood, I have no authority over them. I hope I have influence into them, but I have no authority over them. And this is the beginning of transitioning that for you and for them. There are so many, well, save it for next time. I'll just end with this. There are so many children in our world today, young adults in our world today, we have a term for it, right? Adulting. I just can't adult today. What, where did that term come from? What it came from is we have a whole generation of people that are getting to adulthood completely unprepared to direct their own lives. It's not that they don't have intelligence. It's not that they don't have, uh, they just haven't been given the tools to direct their own life. So now it's like, well, what do I do? The, the mom and dad's rules are gone. I have to take care of myself. I don't have the tools. This is a big part of avoiding that is I'm going to put you in situations where you get to choose. And we talked about it last time. You're going to mess up. I'm going to let you mess up as long as it's not a fatal mistake. 
I would much prefer you make your own choice and I will help you deal with the consequences as long as there are consequences we can deal with, right? I'm still not going to let my three-year-old run in front of a car. I'm still not going to let my 16-year-old go and get hooked on hard drugs, right? Because I can't, we can't fix that. That's a permanent mistake. But as long as it's short of a permanent mistake, I'll just help you fix it rather than prevent you from doing it because I want you to learn. And that comes here. Um, we will come back to conversation. I'll probably roll that into next week. We'll, we'll touch on using conversation and lecture as kind of the gold standard, ultimately. It's the most difficult, it's the most time-consuming, but it's the most rewarding form of discipline. And it bleeds into just a healthy relationship with your child in general. And then we'll touch on what happens when you get to the end and they're adults and they're doing their own thing. How do you, how do you get to there successfully? That one's still very much theory for me. I haven't gone through it. I've seen a lot of other people go through it, so hopefully you get something beneficial. Again, I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, I hope this has been helpful and beneficial. I have lots more I could say, so if this is something you're interested in, I'd love to have a conversation. We'll take a few minutes, and then we'll get into our main service. God bless.